Hey guys, my name is Tommy. Welcome back to another episode of Min Maxing for Fun and Profit, where we remind our players that if it has stats, we can kill it, whilst simultaneously behind the screen reminding our GMs that if they think it has stats, they will in fact try to kill it. So before we get down to business here, first off, we gotta say congratulations to Ian for winning our Hero Forge giveaway. The next giveaway drops at 106 subscriptions, and we're at like 98 right now, so it's just around the corner, stay tuned. Anyway, after this video, min-maxing for fun and profit is going to take a little bit of a break. I have another idea for a video series I want to run in this slot, and I love character optimization, but since my other two video series, one covering the lore of Galerion and the other covering non-core races, both have definitive deadlines, we're going to take this one out and slot it in with a new video series. Now, of course, I still love character optimization, and if you guys want to see more of these videos, if there's a certain character play style that you need some help optimizing or you're curious how to run a certain kind of thing by all means let me know and we'll bring min maxing for fun and profit back from the dead but that is neither here nor there for now let's dive into the video today we're going to talk about animal companions familiars mounts eidolons you know those things that classes get that can define them as a class Oftentimes, in a highly optimized party, the druid's bear companion or the cavalier's horse will just fall behind and become a liability, especially in the case of an uber-charging knight whose horse is just going to get skewered by whatever comes along and hits it, taking the lancer off his mount, taking the damage out of the fight. Of course, as we have discussed, there are plenty of feats to give us big, shiny, scary monsters. Likewise, there are feats for the wizard to trade in his raccoon familiar for something like an imp, a small elemental, a pixie, things of this nature. But in Pathfinder, the feat tax can be a very real and very crushing thing for character builds. Today we're going to go a little bit off the rails for rules as written when we discuss the added monsters and creepy crawlies we get with our class and talk about a new way to do it that keeps the fun going, keeps whatever we choose relevant without going so far as to break the game. And of course, there is a story behind this. Flashback to the summer of 2014. The woman who I am now married to is just now coming around and she happens to come around on the same day that I am GMing a D&D game. She decides she wants to play, and as we're sitting at my house waiting for time to pass, she rolls up a human ranger. We're above level 4, so she gets to the point where she needs to choose an animal companion, and I suggest a bear, a wolf, you know, those things that it says in the book you may choose from at certain levels. None of these things really resonate with her, so we start flipping through 3.5's monster manual until eventually we settle upon the owlbear. She decides... For her animal companion, she wants an owlbear. I look over the stats, and it resonates just as well in Pathfinder. An owlbear is not that much stronger than a regular bear and also has animal level intelligence, so I decide to let her run with it. Flash forward to about six months later, that D&D group falls apart, and I join the Pathfinder group, which goes on to be the best friends I've ever had in my entire life, people I'm building my life around, and 100% of the reason why I have enough tabletop role-playing game experience to be able to make Black Dragon Gaming in the first place. We're playing a Gestalt game, and she plays a Gestalt Druid Ranger. This gives her two animal companions. She knows she wants to take an owlbear, she takes the owlbear. When fourth level comes around, she becomes a little stymied again. We flip through the book a little bit, and she settles upon a giant eagle as her animal companion. Now, of course, a giant eagle has well over over animal level intelligence and can even go so far as to understand a language. I'm a little leery at first, but I decide to let it go. Worst case scenario, we can always roll it back, make it a rock, or just a regular eagle that's had some magic cast on it to be just a big dumb flying bird. By doing this, I have gratuitously broken the rules and given the druids something they should never have had. And you know what that giant eagle did over the course of the campaign? It did some flyby attacks, it pecked at some things, mostly it died trying to keep up with optimized characters. And mind you, this is a giant eagle that is played with no knowledge whatsoever of the animal companion chart that comes with the druid in the core rulebook. We assumed it had magical beast skill ranks per level, it got a hit dice every level, a feat every odd level, ability score increase every four, and nobody has to worry about rolling handle animal checks to convince your animal to attack something, to scout something, what have you. So this gets me to questioning a lot of things, and I spend the next couple weeks flipping through Paizo's rules for animal companions, finding that they start with 
of dumbed down stats no matter what they are eventually by level seven some of them will increase in size get things like pounce get ability score increases however the game does progress after level seven and eventually these animal companions just fall short and from my experiences, if you're playing a super optimized animal companion, and this is an animal companion who's wearing the belt of physical perfection, the headband of mental perfection, read all the books and manuals so its stats have gone up as high as possible and still it falls dead, how can an optimized party expect to run with the animal companion rules that are provided us? And don't even get me started on familiars. At the topic of huge contention across the internet, recently revealed to me in our Roll20 game that rules as written, familiars do not get feats. As the familiar and the familiar's caster advance, the familiar's intelligence score goes up and it's not too terribly long in the game before the familiar is more intelligent than your average human fighter. Familiars are about nine times out of 10, teeny tiny itsy bitsy dogs and cats and birds and things that often are not really going to affect the course of combat in a major way anyway. We have the improved familiar feat, which allows us to trade out our dog, our cat, our bird for again, something like a small elemental or an imp or a little baby angel or a sprite. All of these things growing in intelligence as the witch or the wizard or whatever you're playing that has the familiar advances in level. Oftentimes when I'm watching games, I see people forget about their familiars until they're targeted with an area of effect spell and the GM says, okay, your familiar needs to roll too. And oftentimes this just results in a cooked little animal. To me, I feel like we're just pooping on the fun and pooping on the player here. Of course, we have things like monstrous companion, monstrous mount, even outright leadership. So our druid can get a magical beast, so our cavalier can ride into battle on the back of whatever flavor of dragon he would like to have this week. But this costs us a feat, and in this one's humble opinion, especially on certain builds, in this one's humble opinion, a feat tax to stay only kinda sorta relevant is unfair. So today, I'm going to propose a new system for our optimized campaigns that allow our druids to begin play with something like a young red dragon, if they so choose to allow our cavaliers to begin play riding into battle on the back of a chimera, if that's their jam. Yes, on paper, this sounds absolutely crazy, and in low power games or games with a low point buy, this can certainly unbalance things really fast. But if you're a GM, and you've got a lot of players who are going to be really optimizing that power attack with whatever high crit range weapon they want to today. Or if you know your player is really into books where knights ride dragons or Greek mythology and would be really happy with something like this, then I encourage you to give it a go. Because speaking from experience, playing monstrous cohorts, monstrous animal companions does not make you invincible. It lets you have fun. Basically, here we're going to use the notion that anything at all in any bestiary can be rolled down to however many hit dice to be appropriate. Everyone remembers the wise words of Gaston, there are no dragons in here, it's just math. Reduce the numbers and a horde of goblins with short bows can still take down whatever monster you're bringing in. This does require a little bit of legwork and a lot of people will shy away from this. Once you get the hang of what you're doing though, it's pretty easy. First thing you gotta do is roll your hit dice down to one. For example, we'll look at a young red dragon who begins play with 11 d12 hit dice. If we roll his hit dice down to one, looking at our 19 con score, a plus four, that's 16 hit points at first level, about as much as you're going to expect from the average barbarian and in no way, shape, or form, unkillable. Things dependent on hit dice will also roll down with the fall of the hit dice. All of this information can be easily found with the power of the internet, a dragon has a good base attack bonus, and all three of his saving throws are good. So when we compare that to something like a monk who also has three great saves, that means our base save becomes two across the board for our fort, our reflex, and our will, and our base attack drops from 11 down to one. That puts our red dragon's fort save from 11 to six, his reflex save from eight to three, and his will save as well down to three. With the loss of hit dice, we also roll back ability scores. We all know every four levels, we sink one point into an ability score of our choosing, that being 4th, 8th, 12th, 16th, and 20th. A young red dragon has 11 hit dice. So we assume he got an increase to whatever is his highest ability score, in this case, by and large, his strength at 4th and 8th level. 
Thus, we roll our 25 down to a 23, which is still a pretty high strength, but an orc gets that level of strength as well, and a paladin smiting evil is going to be able to swing in the same universe as somebody with as high of a strength score. This takes our bite, two claws, two wings, and tail slap from 17 down to a base attack of 7 for the bite and the two claws, and 2 for his two wings and his tail slap. Much more manageable, and again, not swinging that much higher than the average human barbarian at this level. Even though he has 6 attacks, if he's only adding a little bit to the secondary attacks, he may not even hit something with a decent armor class. Now we are specifically discussing a dragon because they are a little more complicated when we're rolling them down because they have spell-like abilities and special attacks. This requires a little bit of brain power on our parts and as far as I'm aware there's no real definitive formula for some of these things. So this is only one man's opinion. If your GM wants to do it different or you're a GM and you wish to do it differently than me, by all means as long as everyone's having fun that's the point, right? A red dragon's breath weapon is a 40 foot cone DC 19 with a 60 10 fire damage. The save DC for all dragon breath weapons are 10 plus half their hit dice plus their constitution modifier. After knocking his hit dice down to 1, the DC becomes 10 plus half his hit dice rounded down 1 plus his con mod of 4, meaning it's only a DC 15 reflex save to take half damage from this thing. Which means things with high dex, or things with rogue levels, things with ranger levels, things with evasion, are going to dodge this taking no damage, easy peasy. Of course at level 1, 6d10 is a little, oh I don't know, crushing, so we roll this down as well. Since normally dragons have an increased multiplier as they age in terms of breath weapon damage dice, and we may not even be using this if you the GM feel that over the course of a campaign this young dragon needs to become a great worm, then hey, more power to ya. But of course that takes years and years and years and years, so it's more than reasonable to say that doesn't happen. I think what's fair is to start the breath weapons damage dice down at 1d whatever it happens to be, and then increase it every odd level. We're looking at 1, 2, first dice, 3, 4, second dice, 5, 6, third dice, 7, 8, fourth dice, 9, 10, fifth dice, and 11, 12, six dice. Following that chart is an easy enough way to determine a dragon's breath weapon damage without breaking the game. By the time he's doing this damage, a lot of things are going to be, in the case of the red dragon, resistant or outright immune to fire. And at low levels, again, we can build things to dodge this easy peasy. If you feel like 1d10 damage every four rounds in a cone is a little too much, it's also more than reasonable to slap something on the dragon, something along the lines of you can use it at first level one time per day, scaling up as you level, something like how Form of the Dragon gives a spellcaster a breath weapon. A creature would retain the skill ranks per level of whatever it is that it happens to be. For example, a dragon gets skill points equal to 6 plus its intelligence modifier. In the case of our young red dragon, that means we get 7 skill ranks per level and we retain the class skills of whatever we are. In a dragon's case, that is appraise, bluff, climb, craft, diplomacy, fly, heal, intimidate, all the knowledge checks, linguistics, perception, sense, motive, spellcraft, stealth, survival, swim, and use magic device. Yes, this hands the animal companion the ability to roll the knowledge check for whatever question you need to answer, but it's not getting a crazy bonus. It can certainly still natural one and get false information in a high powered game, not really that overpowered at all. A CR 10 11 hit dice young red dragon has a plus 12 natural armor bonus. With the plus one from his dex canceled out by the neg one from his size, this is the only thing the red dragon is using for its armor class of 22, which at first level can be a nightmare to hit. Characters that wish to optimize their armor class even at low levels will begin play with armor classes comparable to this. It's not uncommon to see a character start play with something like an armor class of the high teens or low 20s if that's what they're trying to do. However, if you feel that this is a little too much, go ahead and roll it down. There's no formula for it, but if I was to roll down a young red dragon's natural armor, a plus 12 bonus with 11 hit dice, I would assume the formula we're looking at here is its hit dice plus 1, 11 hit dice having a natural armor bonus of 12. So at level 1, the natural armor bonus on this dragon would be only 2, putting his armor class from 22 down to 12. 
A young red dragon spell list isn't super crazy, so there's not a whole lot of need to roll it down, but if somebody wants to play something that gets high level spells as a spell-like ability, the easiest way in my opinion to do this is to grant the creature the use of the ability when it reaches the amount of hit dice that a wizard would need to have access to those spells. The young red dragon having three times a day, shield or true strike, and at will, mage hand message, prestidigitation, and read magic is what you would expect on your average wizard. So let's instead pretend that our summoner wants to call to his aid in times of trouble, something like, oh, I don't know, a solar angel. On paper, yeah, crazy, game-breaking, super terrible. Of course, we would roll everything down on this character to represent one hit dice instead of its 22. Included in this would be its spells. A solar angel can cast, once per day, power word kill, a certainly instant kill spell most of the time at low levels. Power word kill is a ninth level spell for everyone who gets it. A sorcerer gets his first ninth level spell at 18th level, and by the time we've reached 18th level, the question, do you have 100 or less hit points, becomes a little less relevant. Therefore, I'd be more than happy and I can say this as a player character being married to someone who did in fact leadership in a solar angel using these rules and we watched it die helpless that it can't have power word kill until 18th level. The same thing goes with all of its spells. Yes, this requires a little bit of book work, but the min-maxing player probably knows a lot of this stuff anyway. And if not, the amount of book work they're putting in to roll this guy down and to figure out when they would get all these things, in this one's humble opinion, more than justifies handing them a quote-unquote overpowered companion idol on mount whatever that we can certainly still kill. With this new concept of determining what our mounts and animal companions and eidolons and familiars and things can do, we would be choosing to ignore the things that would push it over the top. For example, if our summoner decides they want a solar angel at one hit dice at level one as their companion, that's fine, but it's more than reasonable, as well as incredibly safe, to take away evolution points from the summoner in exchange for handing them a weakened angel. It's probably an affront to whatever god is granting the solar angel to give this thing pounce anyway, no evolution points. By the same notion, the mounts and the animal companions would not receive the strength and dex increase as they level if we're choosing something that already has a whole lot of strength or a whole lot of dex. We're not trying to have our cake and eat it too here, and we're not trying to overpower the table with our new shenanigans. We're just, again, trying to have fun, explore new character concepts, and stay relevant in high-level play. Familiars classically across levels will become smarter and have access to other things as that spellcaster levels, in this one's humble opinion, if we roll whatever they're taking down to one hit dice. Not that terrifying, not that powerful, very easy to kill. I don't know if I'm the only person in the world who ever played the original Neverwinter Nights, but that game had no problem handing you a pseudo dragon and method at first level, and it has a low enough amount of hit points that if it catches a crossbow bolt, that probably spells the end of the thing. Let's look at the classic familiar of an evil spellcaster, the Imp. It has three hit dice and 13 intelligence. Roll it down to one hit dice, meaning at max, if you're not rolling for hit points, it has 10 HP. Yes, it will be smarter than the average human fighter, but if you simply don't apply the intelligence increase that the familiar would receive as the wizard levels, it retains a base of 13, which is not all that powerful. Roll down the DC for its poison, give it the spells when a spellcaster would qualify. As far as feats go, and this one is especially the case for the familiar, who again, certainly smarter than the average bear, and probably also smarter than the party's fighter, let them have feats, let the players choose the feats they get, as they would at every odd level. It's no more overpowered than anybody else putting any feat on any other character. Even if they come up with something really good, they still only have a certain number of hit dice and are still very killable. So let's compare these three things that we've talked about, a young red dragon for our druid venerating the apex predator, which dragons often are, choosing to form an alliance with one, the summoner who beseeches the divines for help and is granted a solar angel, and the wizard who has sold her soul and has been granted an imp to monitor her progress throughout the material world to some low CR encounters to see just how they stack up. Specifically, let's look at a party of four goblins. At CR 1-4, at least from what I've seen and what I have played, goblins are pretty much the stereotypical monster that we fight at low levels. We're going to start with the young red dragon, and we're going to assume 
that the only feat he has, though this may not be the player's choice, is improved initiative. The goblins beat his initiative by one, and though that does not guarantee they will go first in a given combat, it gives them a slight edge. Yes, the dragon can fly up away from them, but if we're assuming this is a combat scenario and eventually the dragon has to attack, eventually the dragon, with a reach of 10 feet, has to get a part of his body close enough to these goblins that the goblins are able to hit him. If we kept his armor class at 22, a basic goblin has to roll at least an 18 with his short bow at at least a 20 and crit with his short sword as of the d20 pfsrd entry which we all secretly know actually says dog slicer to hit this thing but if we roll his armor class down to 12 that means roughly a goblin is hitting this one hit dice young red dragon with his short sword half of the time and needs to roll only an 8 or above to get an arrow lodged in the beast. Of course, we're one-shotting the goblins when we bite, when we claws, when we tail slap, but the barbarian's greatsword or the paladin's greatsword is doing the same amount of base damage as our bite attack. On average, these guys are going to be doing about the same amount of damage. The red dragon is certainly killable, and as you go through encounters, for example, say you have to clear out a goblin cave, the dragon's going to take hits, the dragon's going to expend uses of your healing supplies, and will prove, in this one's humble opinion, to be just as mortal as everybody else on the battlefield. The same is certainly true of an imp. A d10 hit dice with no help from his constitution means this little dude has 10 hit points at level 1. 17 in your armor class is going to be much better than the armor class of your cat, your hawk, your rat, your raven, whatever it is you took, but it's still comparable to a player character, which means we can hit it and 10 hit points in a dungeon type scenario goes away fast. The imp has to enter an opponent's square to attack it because he is size category tiny, after we roll down his hit dice, he only has a plus 6 to acrobatics, which is good, but not perfect. He will still be provoking attacks of opportunity, he will still be taking damage. A Solar Angel has a whopping 44 armor class, which at level 1 means these guys aren't going to scratch him. When we strip the things from his entry that gives him this, such as reducing his plus 5 full plate to a basic non-magical full plate that the summoner has paid for, and removing his natural armor, he ends up with an armor class of 20, which again is on the caliber of player characters. Taking his plus 4 deflection bonus versus evil off until a higher level is again more than reasonable, and certainly too as well is lowering his spell resistance, removing his damage reduction, removing his regeneration, all these things that make him as cool as he is as an endgame encounter, once stripped away, become nothing more than something one gains as he advances in level, not unlike the rest of the players. The Solar Angel's plus 5 dancing greatsword in this setup becomes simply a non-magical greatsword that again the summoner has furnished, and his plus 5 composite longbow with a plus 9 strength bonus that automatically makes a slaying arrow becomes again a non-magical longbow composite or otherwise again furnished by the summoner. At first level, the Solar Angel would have 18 hit points assuming he got max a d10 plus his new con score of 8. Again, that's quite a lot of hit points, but it's not an unending reservoir, and this guy can indeed get hurt. It's also comparable to a Raging Barbarian's hit points, assuming he's got maxed out con. With that d12 hit dice and a maxed out constitution, upped again from Raging, it ends up about the same. At one hit dice, a Solar Angel's Greatsword is a plus 9 to hit, his Longbow a plus 6. This is much more manageable at low level play than the plus 35 or plus 31 that these guys normally get. Instead of 3d6 plus 18 on the Greatsword damage for this guy, we're looking at something more along the lines of 3d6 plus 12. The extra d6 comes from the fact that a Solar Angel is a large creature, and if you feel like shrinking him to balance it, bringing him down to a 2d6. That seems more than fair to me. Either way, he's not swinging much harder than the paladin who smote evil and is attacking, or the barbarian who's raging, swinging an axe over his head, screaming bloody murder. And since a solar angel preps spells like a cleric, I don't see any reason why we don't just let the player assume that the solar angel is more or less a gestalt martial class cleric. If you're playing a Gestalt game, this guy will fit right in in terms of power level, and if you're not, it's more than reasonable for the GM to remove the Solar Angel's ability to cast like a cleric until, again, he qualifies at a certain level. 
And that, in fact, is my two cents on the matter. Maybe I'm crazy, maybe I'm wrong for being able to see monsters not just as big scary things to fight the players with, but things that can be reduced to level with the players to create interesting stories and most importantly, to help people have fun. Have you guys ever done anything like this for better or for worse? If so, tell me about it in the comments and we'll keep the conversation going. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. Stick around for our new series. And again, if you guys love min-maxing for fun and profit, tell me about it. If you've got a particular thing you want statted, tell me about it and we'll make it happen. Till then, this has been min-maxing for fun and profit. <laughs>